one thing that we argue at Coin Center is this term privacy coin is a bad term, uh, at least from a government standpoint, because all of these protocols, if they're going to have long term longevity, are going to adopt privacy enhanced features. Um, and so you should like if you think you're coming for just the bad ones, the privacy coins, this is me talking to government, you've 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 made a mistake in categories like you either have to come for it all or 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 not at all. Do you love coffee and Monero as much as we do? Consider making gratuitous.org your daily cup. Pay with Monero for premium fresh beans. And if you like what you taste, send a digital cash tip directly to the Guatemalan farmers that made it possible. Proceeds help us grow this channel, gratuitous, and Monero. This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Monero.com Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero safely on iOS and Android too. Monero.com Wallet is open source and you always control your own keys. And by IVPN. Resist online surveillance with IVPN, a privacy-focused audited and transparent VPN provider that accepts Monero directly. Monero.com Wallet and IVPN are trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you. And supporting us is easier than ever by typing in MoneroTalk.crypto in your cake wallet send address field to send us a tip. This week on Monero Talk. Douglas Tuman interviews Peter Van Valkenburg, who works as research director at Coin Center. Peter is one of the most well-spoken and impactful advocates for creating a positive cryptocurrency regulation landscape and makes some of the strongest legal arguments for why the government banning of true digital cash-like cryptocurrencies would be unconstitutional. The two discuss the history of legal issues around crypto, OFAC and the current state of AML regulations, the implications of the Tornado Cash case for the Monero ecosystem, the nuisance of sanctioning decentralized exchanges, mixers, and smart contracts, Monero versus Zcash and Bitcoin from a regulatory point of view, whether or not free speech laws are applicable for computer code, and much more. Please note that in the discussion of Zcash's memo field being used to comply with travel rule regulations, Doug seemed to suggest this is not possible with Monero. This is not completely accurate. Monero still does not have TX Extra feature, which could effectively be used as memo field, but the Monero community at large agrees TX Extra should not be used this way, since it would cause chain bloat, affect transaction distinguishability, and is unnecessary due to the benefits of off-chain solutions. Consensus is building around completely deprecating the TX feature, and the point Doug was attempting to make is, Zcash promotes itself as being regulation-friendly, whereas all of Monero's design choices are towards being more cash-like. Monero Talk starts now. All right. Peter, good morning. Good morning, Doug. Thanks for doing this, man. I've been trying to I've been trying to get a hold of you for a long time. Uh, I'm a, I'm a big admirer, big admirer. Oh, I'm think, happy to be here. Yeah, I think I think uh, you're doing great things. Always impressed by what you have to say, and uh, more so how you say it. You're you're a wordsmith. Um, you're you're doing great things for the crypto community. So uh, wor wordsmith is a nice way to put it. A sophist, uh, a lawyer. <laughs> We've got this great term called chicanery, which is when a lawyer is criticized by his peers for making specious arguments that are all about wordplay. Oh, okay. Well, you started yeah. off as an act. You had an acting career at some point, right? I remember reading that quite some time ago. I did. Yeah. Yeah. I, I went to an acting conservatory right out of high school in New York City because I didn't want to do the typical uh, career route, I guess. And uh, then I was trying to be a working actor for a few years and just realized how bad the economics were. So I got an undergrad in economics uh, and then I got a law degree and oh. fell in love with cryptocurrency in the process. So that that's the that's the brief version of my life story. But yeah, I mean, acting and 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 um, public policy or, or law, they're not actually that different because it's very performative for better and for worse. Um, so 
<laughs> right. Well, well, luckily you use those skills for good, not for bad, right? So at least you're on the good side. I like to tell myself that, but yeah. yeah. When did you find crypto? You know, in in law school is that, is that something that ha- it happened? Uh, during yeah, the the, 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 the timing was right because I was I, what I graduated NYU law in 2014 or 2013 2014, um, and so my one L year. Uh, like 2011 is when I first heard about Bitcoin, which was early um, in the you know in, in in the crypto space these days. Um, yeah. But I didn't I didn't do anything about it. I was like I could write papers about this from law school, and I did. I wrote for some professors, um, and I was like maybe I should mine this thing because uh, I, I even I was remember thinking like mining. What a stupid term. Why do they call it mining? <laughs> I was like, I'll try and set up a mining rig. And then I was like, no, I should study for my contracts exam. That was the wrong choice, uh, just from a personal financial standpoint. But, uh, you know, it is what it is. And I, I, I immediately um, fell in love with the tech because while I was an actor, actually, in New York City, instead of waiting tables or, or tending bar in order to pay my bills, because living in New York is expensive, especially when you like get paid almost nothing to be in bad, bad off-Broadway productions. <laughs> um, I, instead of waiting tables, I um, taught myself web design because I was always kind of like internet native um, and made like portfolio websites for fellow actors in the city and, and um, to display their headshots and CVs and things like that. Oh. And so I got I got into like I, I'm terrible I'm a terrible yeah. <laughs> uh, web developer I'm not a web developer, um, but I got really into like internet freedom, um, digital rights, the, the crusade that the Electronic Frontier Foundation led back in the '90s, um, just reading about its history for privacy and free speech online, and I thought like, you know, I kind of want to be like a Josh Lyman type character on The West Wing as an actor. But maybe I could just be a Josh Lyman type character on the West Wing as a human being, right? Played in real I, life. I, I, yeah, so, so far, that's going all right. I don't work for the White House, but I, I'm not sure I would want to. I kind of like being on this side of it. That's awesome. And so, when you discovered Bitcoin, did it did it uh, you know really strike you? Did you did you kind of get to the root of it right away? Like, holy shit, this thing is decentralized. It's censorship resistant uh, communication system. I was really skeptical, so I, I will not at all suggest that I was smart enough to see that it was going to work at the time. I, the one thing I knew just from being in the sort of digital civil liberties space, just intellectually for a while, was that payments on the internet were terrible. You know, PayPal was, was fairly new and was the hot thing. And it's like, this is awful. This is just another version of Western Union. And yeah, they have a website, but why is it better? It's not. Um, and so I knew that there was a, there was a problem to be solved. I was by far not smart enough to know, you know, to look at the the white paper or or let alone the the C plus plus code and say, yeah, yeah, this solves it. And I, I think I was probably wrongly too skeptical that you know some things about it were silly, like the mining term and 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 the fact that it was um, fully you know separate from the legacy financial system. Like if you think about it, like the the previous. Um, attempts at, at solving this issue of payments online were like David Shams, eCash. And, it, and there was still a notion that banks would play some role, like they'd be at least issuing the units and redeeming them, sort of like stablecoins ended up being. Um, but there would be some level of privacy in between because they'd be digitally signed notes that you know would be effectively like bearer instruments. But it's not surprising in retrospect that banks didn't want to play along with an eCash type system because what's in it for them? What are the incentives and what are the the risks from their regulatory posture? Uh, and it, it, in retrospect, it's not surprising that a fully you know private currency, which I also like for other reasons. I went I, my econ undergrad was at George Mason, so I am somewhat steeped in Austrian economics. Um, oh, okay. Only at the undergrad level, I, I wouldn't claim to be, you know, a master's level or PhD level, but I I fell in love with Hayek and. Um, and the idea of like competing currencies and free money and free banking. Um, so, so uh, you know, I, I had all the, the right ideas to be able to embrace Bitcoin. I was still not smart enough to look at it and be like, yes, I'm going to buy all of this right now. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you, you got there fast enough, faster than most. So I wouldn't be too hard on yourself. And uh, now, now you're doing great things. So... Well, you know, when you did start to really, you know, grasp it and understand it, 
what was your reaction from a legal standpoint? Was it that, oh, they're going to, you know, they're going to tr- try to shut this thing down or, you know, you, you know, or is it like, you know, that it's this is cypherpunk. They'll never be able to stop it. What What is, you know, what was kind of your, your take there? Well, so so really early on um, when I was in law school, the stuff that I was most interested in was copyright law because of the big battles for the Internet and for freedom being fought over things like the Digital Millennium Copyright Act and the anti-circumvention um, provisions, which say if you, you know, if you, if you have a, a DivX DVD, an, a, one of those terrible old DRM DVDs, and you rip it using a software tool that rips the DRM out of it, uh, you, you're liable under the anti-circumvision provisions. So those were the kinds of issues I was really interested in because I thought, like, it's stupid. You should be able to share movies with your friends. You know, you just should. Um, and so when I was thinking about Bitcoin uh, and the, you know, a couple, I think, it, I think when I was graduating, yeah, the Ethereum crowd sale or the Ethereum project was just getting going. Um, and so I was thinking like, this is interesting. There's this whole community that's self-organizing, even though there's no intellectual property rights, everything's MIT licensed, everything's open. And the incentives to collaborate are different, though, than previous open source projects like, say, Linux or something like that, where you don't really need this trade association, the Linux Foundation, to like get companies to, to, you know, to buy service contracts for putting Linux on their servers. The incentives here for doing the development are all the same old incentives. Like, I just want to make this tool. I'm a, I'm a coder, so I'm going to release this code freely and I'm going to use it myself. That's why I wrote it, but I'll share it with anyone else. But also, of course, the fact that now there are these scarce digital properties or digital commodities that if people who are early to the project and build the project happen to own and the project happens to do well because of the network effects of writing good software, they'll be compensated in in a way that's, I think, much more fair and much better than, say, the exclusive rights you get from a patent or a copyright and the licenses that people pay you to use your your ideas, which just locks that technology down, prevents free free exchange of information, all that. So that's that was the first thing that I thought was interesting from a legal perspective is here's another argument for why we don't need copyright and patents, actually, mm-hmm. because we can build these decentralized systems that still incentivize people to be creative. But that's very academic. I was not actually like a practical lawyer back then. Um, query whether I'm a practical lawyer today. <laughs> but um, I found Jerry Brito, or Jerry Brito, who's the executive director of Coin Center, found me. He had written a much more practical, um, aimed at lawyers and policymakers uh, primer on how Bitcoin worked and what the actual, like, really, like, first principles legal issues would be. Things like, back then, people thought, well, this is unconstitutional, right? Because only the federal government's allowed to coin money. There's a, there's a clause in the Constitution. That's all silly because actually that clause is just binding against the states so that we don't have Alabama bu- Alabama bucks versus um, Georgia bucks versus the U.S. dollar. But that was an early question. So Jerry Brito uh, found me and um, he had written this primer on Bitcoin uh, for policymakers. And it was the first time that someone wrote in sort of the language that lawyers and people in government expect uh, a description of Bitcoin and then a description teeing up the legal issues, the big ones that early on people thought might be consequential. Some of them turned out to be sort of nothing burgers, but like an early one was, oh, well, only the federal government's allowed to coin money, right? It's in the constitution. And people are like, so is Bitcoin illegal? And the answer to that is just a plain flat no, because that part of the constitution is just binding against the states because we don't want Alabama coin competing with Georgia coin competing with the federal government's um, currencies. And so private people can coin their own money. Maybe they can't call it money and that gets into some other issues, but you know, they can, we can have private currencies or private, private payment systems. And so Jerry wrote this primer. It also teed up bigger issues like money transmission licensing, which ended up being the first big battles we fought in 2014 when we started coin center together. Um, But at that point, because it was the beginning of Coin Center, we've actually been around for a pretty long time now in crypto years. We were looking at much more pragmatic issues, like, you know, the New York Bit license was being drafted by Ben Blosky, if any of you remember that. Yeah, uh, that was a whole headache because uh, uh, it was very broadly drafted. It was a mess. California was was still asking, you know, should we incorporate this into our money transmission licensing rules for people who run ATMs or people who run exchanges? Um, and you know, to some extent, those questions are still half unanswered. They've gotten a lot better, I think, in part because of Coin Center's work. But 
but yeah, I mean, that's when it became very obvious that there were many, many places where the U.S. laws, international laws would would intersect with the, the things that the technology allowed people to do. And that intersection wouldn't always be pretty. Um, you know, you can go on. Anti-money laundering became an, another big fight. Um, securities law became a big fight for coins that did any kind of IC, ICO, which uh, uh, no one should have done. <laughs> but, you know, it goes on and on. And now here we are with um, sort of finally running up against what is probably the most frightening aspect of U.S. policy because it's very unyielding and sometimes for the right reasons, which is national security and anti-terrorism uh, with sanctions law. So, yeah, the, right. the, that, that that brings us to where we're at today. Um, so I'm sure you saw this coming down the pipe in one form or another, right? Um. I mean, it's always been sort of something on our minds. We wrote a backgrounder. We actually had a, a, a really great lawyer uh, write a backgrounder for us four or five years ago, just explaining what OFAC was, um, just so that people knew that this law was out there and could could impact people's use of cryptocurrencies. And OFAC is a scary law because it applies to everyone. Unlike the Bank Secrecy Act, which applies to people who are moving other people's money, like as a third party, like a Coinbase, uh, they need to know their customers. They need to do suspicious activity reporting, all that. Unlike the BSA, OFAC's rules about sanctions apply even to ordinary individuals. They apply to Coinbase, but they also apply to me as Peter Van Valkenburg, who happens to own some Bitcoin and wants to send a transaction online. The rules are simpler. Like I don't need to necessarily like keep records of all the people I pay. I don't need to file suspicious activity reports when I pay someone who's kind of skeevy. The only thing I need to do is not pay someone on that list. So it, but it's, decept <laughs> it's, it's deceptively simple though, right? Because you know, how do I know if a Bitcoin address that I'm paying or a Monero address that I'm paying is someone on that list? And what level of diligence am I just an ordinary person, not a bank, not a financial institution obligated to do in order to determine that that person's not on that list? Are most Americans even aware that there is a, a list of people I'm not supposed to pay? It's called the Specially Designated Nationals List, the SDN list. OFAC makes a really good, you know, usually the government's not great about putting out machine readable data. Like they release a lot of things in PDFs, which is kind of annoying. Uh, but here there's a JSON uh, uh, form. There's a comma separated value form uh, of the list. There's like every every version of the list you could possibly want is available. And Treasury makes a lot of efforts to just be like, here, just plug it into your back end of whatever Internet tools you're using to pay people. So like these have huge this, there's huge questions here. But until 2018, the rubber hadn't uh, hit the road yet in 2018. OFAC adds two Iranian nationals um, to the OFAC list, um, to the SDN list. They say, look, these people are they're engaged in cyber terrorism. They're doing ransomware attacks and they're using that funneling that money back into Iran's nuclear weapons program. And so these two Bitcoin addresses, just two, are the destination for the ransomware payments. And so because these people, these two Iranians are sanctioned now, um, you can't pay these Bitcoin addresses because you'd be paying these Iranians. And so that was the first time that sanctions law actually directly applied to sort of crypto. And, you know, I think we wrote a blog post about it um, and we talked about it in a few places, like in panels and things. But in some sense, it wasn't controversial because it was sort of just the same as any other use of sanctions power, like setting aside whether economic sanctions are the right way to do foreign policy and whether it's you know good for the world because that's a much bigger question that goes beyond cryptocurrency, goes, goes to the whole global financial system. Setting that aside, this is a fairly non-controversial application because just like if they added two Iranians to the SDN list, I wouldn't pay them on PayPal or I wouldn't pay them using a bank wire. Uh, it makes sense to, to tell me I'm not supposed to pay them using Bitcoin. In fact, in some ways it's even kind of good because now if a regulator comes to you as a, a Bitcoin exchange, for example, and says, are you doing OFAC compliance? You can say, yes, you've added two addresses to the SDN list. We, a custodial Bitcoin exchange, we were not going to have our customers pay those addresses. And then you can sort of check a box and say, look, they're, they're not paying these to Iranians. What I think I didn't expect, or maybe I partially expected, but it happened sooner or more abruptly than, than I'd hoped, is that 
the OFAC list would begin to include not just the addresses of people, but the addresses of smart contracts. And in many ways, this is a sort of a problem that you could only predict if you really understood the difference between Ethereum and Bitcoin, wherein a lot of addresses on Ethereum are not people. And so if that address ends up on the SDN list, who's actually being sanctioned? Because if you're paying the Tornado Cash smart contract, there's no person or even group of persons who has control over the assets you're putting into that contract. The rules of the contract control the assets and they will they will run until the Ethereum network you know, collapses. So maybe they'll run as long as, <laughs> I don't know. It, it, it depends on like your, your optimism about Ethereum being a, a longstanding part of, of, of human society, but it, it could be as longstanding as the global financial system thus far. So like it'll run forever potentially with no ability to change those rules. So if OFAC is here to sanction people to get a change in behavior, why are they sanctioning a robot that whose behavior will never change? And if OFAC's we can get into sort of our potential legal challenge to the designation of Tornado Cash, but if their power from Congress in, in the statutes that give them the power to enforce sanctions law is a power to sanction people, entities, or the property of, of foreign persons or entities, then this smart contract address is none of those things. And so maybe it's actually not correct under the statute for them to take this action. They're beyond their statutory authority. And we don't even need to jump to things like constitutional arguments about free speech. We can just say, look, Congress sent you to sent you there to do a job. They clearly spelled out your power. It is a pretty broad power, but it's not a power that allows you to, to put ideas on this list. It only allows you to put property on this list. So anyway, so it's like, Go ahead. It, I think this has been coming for a long time. Um, but it's a sort of a unique combination of things because the mere application of sanctions law to just somebody's Bitcoin address is, is I think, pretty non-controversial. Even the sanctions against Blender, which was a custodial mixer, privacy tool for Bitcoin transactions, but you trusted the person to mix the funds for you. That's still fairly non-controversial because somebody holds those private keys and that person could properly be the target of sanctions. But then we get to Ethereum, where the mixer can be fully non-custodial, can be just a part of the protocol, basically, because every smart contract written to Ethereum kind of ends up being part of the protocol if it's, if it's immutably, immutably added to the blockchain. And so now we have this much harder question of, can they really just start adding things that are more like pure software tools to the blocked list that you are no longer allowed to interact with as an American? Right. So, so as it stands, they effectively sanctioned a tool by way of sanctioning these addresses? I think so. So this is the problem is OFAC doesn't exactly go through a like a very clear and orderly process of giving notice to all the parties, having an opportunity for challenge, a hearing in front of a court of law with a neutral decision maker, all the typical processes. They also don't do substitute processes that administrative agencies typically do, like notice and comment rulemaking, uh, where there's like, in 60 days, we're going to have a final rule. Here's our preliminary rule. Tell us your thoughts. They don't do that either. So what they do is they issue a press release. Hey, we're, we're sanctioning these parties. They add the names of the parties and any aliases, like the Ethereum addresses in this case, to the SDN list. And they say, you are now, from this day forward, not allowed to interact with any of this. And there's some ability to use an administrative process to challenge those distinctions after the fact. But there's not a lot of legal reasoning in advance of that. So it's hard to know exactly what was done and what was the sort of state of mind of the regulators in this case. like. The press release reads very similarly to the Blender uh, custodial mixer sanction, as if they don't recognize the difference. Maybe they recognize it and they just didn't say it in the press releases, but the press releases are identical and don't seem to even hint at the, at the possibility that there'll be a difficulty here because we're sanctioning a smart contract and a robot instead of sanctioning a series of people who are operating a custodial mixer. And so we can... All we can do is speculate at this point. There, there's other processes that OFAC is supposed to do uh, internally 
it's kind of classified or kind of private, unfortunately, which is not great from a rule of law standpoint, but that's the trade-off we make in the case of national security, where we don't want to tip off the, the terrorists to our impending actions. Um, those processes are things like a collateral impact assessment. And so in the past, when OFAC has gone and sanctioned, say, a bank, like a bank in Honduras that's used by drug cartels to launder money, that bank very well might have several American um, account holders who have done nothing wrong, who are actually not at all involved in the, in the illicit side of the business. And the collateral impact assessment is done internally at OFAC to say like, okay, well, we need to be careful because in taking this action that we're justified in taking against the cartel uh, money launderers, we don't want to we don't want to unduly harm American financial interests like all the Americans who might have accounts at this bank. And so we'll work with the bank to clean up their practices or unwind their accounts to make sure that Americans get their money back. And all of this will be done in an orderly way so that we don't have these problems. I'm not sure any of that was done with Tornado Cash, and I'm not even sure it could have been done easily because there's no bank to work with. Like, can you go and work with the smart contract on the Ethereum blockchain to tell the smart smart contract to only give money back to Americans and not give money back to North Korea? No, you can't because you can't tell a robot that has strict rules to do something that are against its strict rules. You can't have a sensible conversation with a robot. And so there's a lot of collateral impacts here that I think are not accounted for. and Again, going back to what you just asked, like the question is, did they know that there would be these different issues that come from the difference in this sanction versus previous sanctions? And did they just not care? Or did they not really know the difference between a non-custodial mixing technology or privacy technology and a custodial mixer? And how about the, you know, so these rules seem to be contrary to what FinCEN laid out, right? In terms of saying, you know, we could... We could go after, you know, uh, those uh, com companies that are, are benefiting from mixing technology, but we can't go after, you know, just mixing technology software, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that, that's an excellent point. So in 2019, FinCEN guidance, and for your listeners who aren't, you know, <laughs> regrettably steeped <laughs> in U.S. Uh, anti-money laundering policy, Treasury does most of it. Uh, Treasury is divided into bureaus. OFAC is one bureau of Treasury. They're the ones that do sanctions. FinCEN is another bureau of Treasury. They do, they're the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. So they mostly collect information from domestic financial institutions, like suspicious activity reports and things, and share them with law enforcement. So you might want to start investigating this thing. We got this tip from this, excuse me, we got this tip from this bank. And so FinCEN has to decide who is effectively a bank or a financial institution for the purposes of their reporting obligations under the Bank Secrecy Act. And so this has been a question for a while. OK, well, lots of people are involved in the crypto space. There's individual users, there's miners, there's node operators, and there's exchanges. There's within the subcategory of within the category of exchanges, there's subcategories, there's sort of DEXs or decentralized exchanges. And then there's custodial exchanges, which are sort of the most commonly known, like Mt. Gox, uh, to, to use a bad example of an early one, or Coinbase or Kraken or FTX, any of the big players now who are much more regulatorily compliant. And so FinCEN came out in 2019 with extensive guidance going through all of these types of persons and judging just based on its internal regulations and its statute from Congress, which gives it power, which of these are and are not money services businesses or financial institutions, and therefore which of these persons actually has the obligation to actively seek the identity of the persons that they're, they're, they have as their customers and to file suspicious activity reports to the government if their customers are doing something sketchy. And FinCEN came up with some really clear distinctions that I think are, act are, are actually excellent. So you know, bear in mind, this is a different side of treasury than OFAC. They, they work with different laws and different statutes, and so they're not bound by each other's decisions here. But FinCEN nonetheless came up with really sensible policy on a very similar issue, which is financial crime and anti-money laundering and counterfinancing of terrorism. And their distinction, on, on they made several distinctions, among them saying things like minors are not financial institutions. Great, because they're not. They don't control people's funds. But the big one that you just highlighted, which is really important from a privacy standpoint, is they said, look, 
as we see it, there's two types of services or systems out there. There's custodial mixing services or service providers. And these are, these are basically like Coinbase. I mean, Coinbase wouldn't call itself that, but they're just a big omnibus wallet. Money comes in. They have internal records as to whose money is whose. And then money goes out to all the persons. And so it's a mix. And so basically what they said is if you're operating a mixing service like Blender.io, you're doing the exact same thing that Coinbase does. And so just like Coinbase, you need to come and register as a custodial exchange or, or a money services business. And you need to identify your customers and file suspicious activity reports. But then there's this other system they described where people use software tools to protect their own privacy. And there's no actual third party involved. The only third party that exists in this setup is a person who wrote software and they call it anonymizing software providers. Um, and these persons writing software are not, according to FinCEN, money services businesses, because they don't actually accept and transmit anyone's money. They just create software tools that allow other people to, to transmit their own money and to do it with privacy. And that, that bucket, I think, would include, absolutely, from what I understand, the Tornado Cash software developers. It would include Monero protocol developers or Zcash protocol developers, you know, the, the, the more private cryptocurrencies. The core protocol is the software. And this to us was, I mean, we had spent a lot of effort in 2016 and onward sort of talking to people at FinCEN who wanted to understand the technology better and helping them understand why these distinctions are important, why it would be an overreach to directly regulate software developers, both from a constitutional standpoint because of First Amendment rights, um, but also just from a good policy standpoint because you, you can't just tell people which software to use and it, it will not work as far as catching criminals. You'll, the criminals are still gonna use the software they're not supposed to use, right? And the innocent people will no longer be able to use that software. And we had, I think, a lot of success. And it's not just us. I mean, it's worth noting that um, uh, one of the real uh, heroes in this space is a guy named um, Mike Mosier, who was at Chainalysis for a time. Before that, he was, I think, at DOJ, um, but then left Chainalysis to go work at FinCEN mm -hmm. and ultimately worked his way all the way up to being the head of the digital currency group within FinCEN and wow. even acting director of FinCEN uh, at one point uh, during the Trump administration when the the outgoing director left and they, they hadn't yet filled a permanent position. And so Mike's role has been huge because uh, he gets it. He's, you know, he's someone who just understands that, you know, <laughs> we have this technology, it exists, you can't put it back in a box. And so it's sensible to regulate the custodial intermediaries because they're just like PayPal or Venmo. It's not sensible to regulate software developers. So that's FinCEN's distinction. But going back to what we were saying in the beginning, it doesn't necessarily bind OFAC at all. And they seem to have taken a different approach here. So uh, assu assuming the worst, assuming that OFAC was cognizant of what they were doing here, and they intentionally did attempt to, you know, or did sanction uh, these smart contracts and by way of doing that sanctioned a tool, uh, mm -hmm kind of, uh, you know, ignored um, what FinCEN had, had, had set as policy. Does that, are we then at the point where something like Monero, something like Zcash, something like Bitcoin is, you know, uh, a, a potential target of, of, the, of a similar type of sanction? Like if they can sanction Tornado Cash, does that mean yeah. legally, you know, using the, the same legal analysis they, they use for those purposes, could they just as easily, you know, sanction, effectively sanction uh, Monero as a tool? Yeah. I'm afraid I have to go off on a little bit of a tangent here because okay, you, mentioned, no you mentioned Bitcoin. And lately I've taken this turn of wanting to sort of speak truth to Bitcoin. I love Bitcoin. Uh, it was the first cryptocurrency I ever owned. I still um, owe more Bitcoin than anything else. Not that I own very much. Um, but Bitcoin's privacy is so bad because, you know, you can use tools like Wasabi Wallet or you can make coin join transactions, but they're not the default. And most people just treat this thing as if they, they think they're getting privacy out of it and they're getting nothing. In fact, they're getting far less privacy than they'd get from the legacy financial system because, of course, there's a blockchain and combine that with chain analysis or TRM labs or any of the other blockchain analysis firms, 
if they want to find out every transaction you ever made, they will, um, unless you take a lot of very hard to do precautions. And so would OFAC start sanctioning Bitcoin as a whole? I mean, we'll get into whether that's legal, but in general, would they want to? I'm not sure they'd want to, because I think actually the foreign intelligence services and the um, counter-terrorist organizations within governments probably like Bitcoin because mm -hmm. they can see absolutely everything far better and with more resolution than they ever could from Wells Fargo or Bank of America. And that's kind of, I think, I mean, we always have to strike this balance between privacy and security, right? To me, Bitcoin's current balance is way out of whack towards no privacy, maybe some good security, you know? But I, 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 obviously, I don't believe in that trade-off being, you know, one that should slide to all the way in one direction, because that's why I'm in this space fighting for the rights of people who develop privacy-protecting software. So then the question is not just as far as like government motivations, um, but pragmatically and under the law, would they be able to add a whole protocol to the SDN list? And this gets into something that's, I think, particularly odd about Ethereum and Tornado Cash in this case, which is, it's true that when you write the series of smart contracts that create the Tornado Cash zero knowledge proof based privacy tool, and you put them on the Ethereum blockchain, and you don't retain the keys to update that contract in the future, which we've had Solidity developers actually look at all of the contracts, all of the consequential contracts are non-updatable. They just, you could mathematically prove that they're not, there's nobody with a private key that could send a transaction to the Ethereum network to change that contract. So if you do that, you've really added protocol-like functionality to Ethereum. There just happens to be this subset of addresses on the Ethereum blockchain where you can get this additional protocol functionality, which is a level of privacy that's akin to something like Zcash or Monero for at least the hop that's going through this one address. But it's also not quite like it's part of the protocol because it lives at an address. It has sort of a, it has a place within the larger blockchain that is identifiable. And because of that, and because the rest of the blockchain is fully public, we can see when ransomware payments from the North Korean hackers end up going into this address. And we can see when payments come out of this address. We don't necessarily know if these are still the North Koreans taking them out, because that's the whole point of the tool. But this is a problem from a government standpoint, because you're going to get pressure um, from political appointees who may not understand the nuances of the technology to say, I can point to that thing. I have Chainalysis and TRM Labs telling me that North Korean money is going into that thing. Ethereum, fine. We're not going to get in the business of shutting down whole protocols, but that thing, that thing's got to go. And under the legal standards, you know, OFAC is empowered to, again, sanction property in which a foreign national has interests. They're not allowed to sanction um, necessarily just an American's property because that would raise all kinds of due process concerns, but they're allowed to sanction property in which a foreign national has interests. And so to some extent, they have a plausible argument that see that address, the Tornado Cash address, we saw North Korean property go into that address. So we're just treating that whole address as sanctioned. And they can point to the address instead of pointing to the whole Ethereum protocol. Now, the problem is you point to that address, you're not just pointing to North Korean money held in that, in that address, you're pointing to American money held in that address, Americans who did absolutely nothing wrong. And the funny nature of zero knowledge proofs is that the best metaphor for what that address is, is it's like a room with safe deposit boxes in it. And people walk into that room and they have one or two boxes that are theirs and they put their tokens into those boxes, they lock them, and they leave. And so my box is not the North Korean box. You know, I've got a key that can only take my assets out. I can't take the North Korean assets out. And it's not great for privacy, it's true, unless a lot of people have boxes in that room, because if the only person ever walking in and out of that room is, is me, they're like, okay, everything in that room is Peter's. But if a lot of people are walking into that room, they're like, okay, Something in that room is Peter's. Something in that room is, is Jerry's. Something in that room is Doug's. We don't know whose is whose. We don't know, you know if, if some of them are terrorists, if some of them are not. It's just a room where people control their own assets in a private way. And so you could say we're sanctioning this whole address because 
it's there's there's a foreign national's property there, but it's like shutting down a whole bank. It's not like shutting down just the property of a foreign national. And really, the innocent Americans who have used this address, their money is not commingled. It's not actually like mixing per se. Um, it's just I have a receipt from a, or I have a zero knowledge proof that will allow me to take the tokens I put in back out. And yeah, there'll be no link between the the original deposit and withdrawal, but it's not mixing uh, it, it, in any like regular usage of that term. And so this is the whole statutory question is, is what is that address? Is it an alias for the property of foreign persons? Is it, is it an alias for um, the, the foreign persons themselves? Or is it just something like a, a, a metaphorical room where people have their assets and other people have their assets, they don't mix. And you can't really then identify just this tool this abstract idea of a room where people can go and put their, and lock their funds in their own boxes, because then you're just sanctioning an idea, an idea that's written in code that exists on the computers of everyone who's ever uh, fully synced with the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, one thing we said in an early post is, is this is not like sanctioning Iranian author who wrote a novel and saying, you're not allowed to pay him to write his next novel. This is like, we're sanctioning an Iranian author. And if you have a copy of his book in your home, like, thousands of Americans might, you're not allowed to read it anymore. It's very different. And so we just need clarity about this because they may have gone beyond their statutory authority. This is a, a hard question. It's a weird question because this is something that is discernibly different than traditional property. I'd say it's not property. It's, it's a pointer to tools. And that does bring us down this road where one day, if this is allowed to stand, why couldn't they just say, all of the addresses on the Bitcoin network, all of the addresses on the Monero network. In fact, just those networks as discernible properties are verboten. Americans can't use them. And that would be a more drastic measure because you'd be obviously impacting a lot more of licit behavior in addition to the illicit behavior you're targeting because obviously these, pro these projects have lots of legitimate uses. But that is even true of the Tornado Cash contract. I mean, Chainalysis, I think Chainalysis estimate um, was only that 25% at most of the funds going into the Tornado Cash smart contract um, are, are, are illicit. So it, these are hard questions. And I, I think we need to slow this process down and have a real legal conversation about it now before it gets to that point where all of Monero, all of Zcash is is disallowed because of OFAC adding all of those addresses or all of that protocol to their list. What do you see that as being as a, like a, a congressional hearing of some sort, or you know what, what what when you say a conversation? Obviously, we're talking about it, but uh, you know what what is that in its most effective form? So there's going to be a few things that are that are going to happen. I think. Coin Center will likely bring a challenge. Uh, we're working with lawyers now. And our challenge is going to be on behalf of Americans who did nothing wrong, who in the past used it for privacy. In fact, Coin Center is one of these people because people have donated to Coin Center in the past using Tornado Cash. And maybe people who want to use it in the future. Coin Center is one of these people because we like private donations. We're a nonprofit. We have a, we have a public mission that benefits society and we need to be funded. And under the First Amendment, you have a constitutional right to, to not have to disclose your donors in a list to the authorities. This happened back in the civil rights movement in the 1960s when Alabama tried to get a list of all of the NAACP's members in Alabama, which you know why they're doing that. It's not for good things. It's not to send them a gift basket. It's really actually scary. So we have a, we have a strong constitutional tradition in the US that private donations to nonprofits are okay, and not just okay, they, they are enshrined and protected in our constitution. So if we want to continue using this tool, and they're saying we can't, we have an injury, um, and we can challenge it. And then, as I said, we would challenge it, I think, primarily on statutory grounds. We'd say the International Emergency Economic Powers Act, IEPA, which gives OFAC its authority here, and is cited by OFAC for why they can do this, actually only allows them to identify entities and the property of foreign entities as targets of sanctions. It doesn't allow them to identify something that's not property 
like an abstract thing, like a smart contract address and the tools found within that address. And we could also have as co-plaintiffs, because you want to have a broad base of persons so that no one, if anyone gets thrown out because you're like, oh, you don't actually have standing to bring this challenge. Your injury isn't real. There's somebody else who could carry on the challenge. I think another like good area of co-plaintiffs or persons who are injured are people who still have Ethereum or USDC in one of those contracts and can't get it back. Because if they got it back by processing the withdrawal transaction, which only they could do and they have the full power to do, and the contract will let them do because the contract's just rules. But if they do that, they're violating OFAC. So in a very real way, assuming there's no general license to Americans to be able to take their money back out, some people are truly being deprived of their property, not just their liberty, not just their right to use the contract, but actually the valuable things that they kept in that contract before sanctions were implemented. And so this is one challenge. It's a, it's a court challenge that Coin Center may bring. Um, I'm qualifying that because we just have to work through uh, our arguments and think about co-plaintiffs and things like that. There's another challenge that I think could come from, actually, I, I've seen uh, Matt Green, um, who is a, a professor at Johns Hopkins, was teaching a course. And one thing in his course was Tornado Cash, and he cloned the GitHub repository. And now he's see seeking injunctive relief mm -hmm. to say it's OK to copy the source code, not to interact with the contract. Because if they take a really aggressive approach, then they're really basically saying you can't even you can't even transmit speech, you can't even transmit code, which is, has grave First Amendment implications. And I think he's working with the Electronic Frontier Foundation on that. Now, just to be clear, if the EFF and Matt were to win on that, it would not take those addresses off the OFAC list, and it would still tee up a larger problem of can they just add all of these protocols to to the OFAC list? So it's an important fight, but we have to win both fights. We can't just win one fight. And then there's also the developers of Tornado Cash itself, whose GitHub um, accounts have been shut down. Um, one was arrested in the Netherlands. These folks, by, by, by all accounts, I don't, I'm not an investigator. I don't know all the facts. But from what I see, they've only written code. And if all they've ever done is write code, then I don't see how they can be the target of sanctions to the extent they are the sanctioned party. We still don't know. All we know is the SDN list says Tornado Cash. Now, do they mean the North Korean property in Tornado Cash? Do they mean the people who created Tornado Cash? Do they mean Tornado Cash as a robot? We don't know. But if it's the people who created it, as in published open source code to the Ethereum blockchain, that also would have First Amendment defenses, I think. But we don't even know if they're going to be acted against. The, the guy in the Netherlands who was arrested, it may be for something unrelated. Uh, we don't have details yet. And we also don't know if the Netherlands government is working with the US government here, or if these, I mean, the timing makes it seem like obviously there's some coordination, but we, we really don't know any details. And the Netherlands, I'll just add, um, because it's worth keeping everyone aware of this fact in the crypto space. I didn't know this until I saw, uh, I read a little bit about Netherlands anti-money laundering law. Unlike the US, the Netherlands has a standard for money laundering that you can be charged with that is based on your negligence rather than your intent or willful laundering of money. So if all you did was just like, because of some carelessness, allow someone else to launder money, you could be charged, which to me is wrong. Like money laundering should be a specific intent crime. The government should have to prove that you really wanted to hide someone's proceeds of crime. Because otherwise, like if I operate a coin laundry, like literally a laundry where you use coins to wash your clothes and someone comes and they like move a lot of cash through my business, I negligently laundered their money. That's stupid. I actually operate a clothing laundry. I should not be liable for really damning criminal and moral approbation or sanctions and things like that. So, so these are the different challenges. And None of them actually involve a congressional hearing, but I will add as a coda to that, it's really great that yesterday, Congressman Emmer, who is in the House of Representatives, uh, who's a real champion for our space, wrote a letter to OFAC and asked excellent questions in that letter. Some of the questions we've discussed on this talk today, um, like, what is it you're sanctioning? Are you sanctioning a person behind these addresses? Do you think they have control over these addresses? Please explain. And so that's that's a great way for someone in Congress who's a real hero um, for people developing these tools to sort of put pressure on the agency. 
short of say a hearing, we, we could we could end up having hearings about this, but we'll we'll have to see. Um, and and even that can only go so far unless Congress was to pass a new law that clarifies the authority that OFEC has. Like a hearing would just be about oversight of the existing law. Passing a new law would change the authority, but that is such a huge battle, especially when the stakes are as high as they are here, because you're going to have people um, talking about terrorism, talking about national security. Do we really want to hamstring our authorities with a tighter law? I don't know. I don't think we want to go down that road because I'm not sure we'd have the votes in Congress to get better clarity. Um, I do think we might have the strong legal arguments to get clarity through a, a court challenge. Awesome, man. So, uh, you know, uh, would it really boil, you know, in this in this court challenge um, where let's say or let's say in this scenario where they potentially try to do what they did to Tornado Cash, they do it to Zcash or, or Monero, right? And saying mm -hmm. you know, they, they sanction essentially just usage of, of these systems. Uh, does the argument really boil down to one of national security versus what free, yeah. free speech what like what's the real balance at the end of the day it's tricky i think the most obvious balance is between due process and national security so if they're saying you can't use a software tool they're not saying that you can't publish it they're just saying you can't use it they have an argument that they're not regulating the publication of code or speech, which would have First Amendment problems, they're regulating conduct. Mm -hmm. And expressive conduct, like protesting, like going out in the streets or burning a flag or nude dancing is considered uh, expressive conduct. These things get some level of First Amendment protection because these are important activities in our democracy, right? Maybe not nude dancing, but certainly protesting in the streets. Oh, arguably nude dancing is a big part of American no, democracy right. and that's fine. You know, you know, um, the problem is that you get a lower standard of scrutiny as to whether the law is allowed to impact your activity. So if all you're doing is publishing a book, there's a high standard for the government to say, we need to impact this activity, a standard that's almost never met, which means if, if what you're doing is just publishing a book, you're almost always uh, assured that if the government was to tell you to stop, you could come back and say, you can't tell me to stop. I have a First Amendment right. If what you're doing is flag burning, the government still can't tell you to stop, but they can say, you're not allowed to do that in this place, in this time, in this manner. And that's that's fair, because on it's like if you're burning like 500 flags doused in gasoline in the lobby of a building, we want them to be able to tell you to stop, right? So conduct gets this lower bar for, for government uh, restrictions, which means you'll get more government restrictions, but that's probably okay in many situations. And so on the First Amendment arguments, uh, like if they were to come and say, no one's allowed to share this code anymore because we don't want people using it, strong First Amendment defense. And I think that's where EFF would come in and they'd fight for that. Uh, and we would fight as well. But if they were only to say, ah, you can share the code all you want. In fact, you could put the GitHub repositories back up. We didn't even tell GitHub to take them down. They're just Microsoft. They're a defense contractor and they're, they're a little chicken about this stuff. Uh, we're, we're just saying you can't use the code. And any American who uses the code is conducting business, is doing conduct that, yeah, might be expressive, but uh, the Constitution doesn't protect that activity as much. Then we need to fight probably on other grounds. And I'm, I'm not sure that like the ACLU or the EFF would be um, game for that challenge because it's a different kind of challenge than just mere free speech challenge. Maybe they would. Um, Coin Center's game for this challenge um, and to me, this challenge is a due process challenge. It's a statutory authority challenge first, which is, is OFAC even empowered by IEPA to do that kind of thing? Or are they just supposed to identify property, not tools? So statutory challenge and then a due process challenge. And the due process balancing is, look, this is a deprivation of liberty and property. And the Fifth Amendment says, no one shall be deprived of liberty or property without notice an opportunity for a hearing and a decision by a neutral decision maker. And the way OFAC is set up, we can just add things to the list whenever we want, doesn't actually protect Americans' due process rights. And so it can't be the mechanism by which technology is suddenly blocked from being used by people. We need to have a different mechanism for that that involves notice, an opportunity to challenge 
you know, real arguments, not just a list that constantly grows and has things like Zcash and Monero on it. Ooh, Unfortunately, yeah, I no, just realized I mean, it. Say, I mean, you know, they, they, they could go through the due process though, right? Couldn't they give everybody right. proper notice and they, you know, that it could be discussed and, they, you know, yes. be debated and then they say, all right, well, we're going to, we're going to go ahead. And, and, and say, it's even worse than that, actually, just to be really clear on the law, because you asked about a balance between national security and what? Mm -hmm. If it's a balance between national security and procedural due process rights, there are established precedents. Um, there's a Holy Land, a case called Holy Land, a case um, about a charity in Oregon. Um, it was an Islamic charity that was uh, um, allegedly supporting Al Qaeda. And in these cases, these are Americans whose liberty and property are being deprived because it's an American uh, nonprofit in both cases, I think. The courts say, look, we need to balance what would typically be required from a procedural due process standpoint with national security's interests. And so we'll accept that there are slightly less procedural due process um, uh, protections in place because of the pressing nature of the national security concern. And these are called the Matthews factors, and it's a balancing test. And any lawyer will tell you when it's a balancing test instead of some sort of strict scrutiny, you're in for a hard challenge. Um, but this is all we can do. You know, this is this is the right challenge to fight, along with the First Amendment challenge. But I don't think the First Amendment challenge will necessarily get us to a point where we can get things taken off the OFAC list that are just tools, because again, they're just going to say we're not banning the publication of the tools; we're just banning the usage of the tools. But we'll see. How about this idea? You know, so so code is speech, right? Where you know that's the kind of the the uh, First Amendment. How about this idea that money is speech, and maybe there there's you know a fundamental right yeah. to to transact and communicate money. So that's that's a great point. I'm glad you brought that up, Doug. So Buckley v. Vallejo and Citizens United are these cases where um, people were making donations to political action committees that were supporting candidates or creating attack ads against candidates. And there was this attempt by the federal government to, to sort of lock that down and restrict the amount of money you can pay, not the candidate, but some political action committee that's supporting the candidate. And in those cases, the Supreme Court said, look, no, um, speech, as in political messages, political movements, requires money. And so there has to be a limit to, to whether people are to, to laws that, that say people are not allowed to pay people to, to support messages, political messages. And so this is the money is speech doctrine. It's not exactly as ironclad as money is speech. Like, like I'm allowed to pay anyone with never have any prior restraint because obviously that would upend our entire regulatory structure for economic uh, regulations and things like that. But it does say, and this also goes to another First Amendment argument, which is called the chilling effect. If your law is unduly um, impacting protected expression, then your law is unconstitutional, even if its original aim was something constitutional, like only affecting certain types of conduct. And this is sort of an overbreath doctrine. And so I do think we could make a strong argument on the First Amendment stand standpoint, and, and probably this would be a coin center type argument. Um, because it goes beyond mere publication. But we could make an argument that, look, um, Coin Center's accepted donations using Tornado Cash. We use the do those donations to further a political message that's important to democracy and human flourishing. You're saying that people will not be able to make anonymous donations using these specific tools. That's a narrow action today, but there's a slippery slope here. Because if you, in fact, in a press release, they even said, we intend to send a message not just to users of Tornado Cash, but to users of any reconstituted Tornado Cash, they know you can cut and paste that code, use it somewhere else, achieve the same result. Maybe it's a whole protocol, maybe it's Zcash Monero. And they know that they intend, I think it's clear in their press release, they intend to chill usage of all of those tools. And so at a certain point, we can make these chilling effect arguments that look, yes, you have power to limit people's ability to say donate to North Koreans who are building nuclear weapons, but you can't simply say all the tools that allow for private donations are illegal because the, there's a, only a tiny amount of people using those tools for something like donating to North Korea. The vast majority are using those tools to maintain their personal privacy, which they should have a right to, 
and it has a strong political uh, First Amendment implication because if you don't feel private, you won't go out and participate in politics because you, you'll always be afraid that, you know, s some innocent but um, intimate and an embarrassing thing in your past will come up and ruin you. Um, and if you're donating to nonprofits that are controversial, this goes back to the NAACP versus Alabama. Who's going to join a civil liberties organization if they know that the corrupt sheriff who wants to lynch you is going to find your name on a list the day after you donate? No one. And so I think we can make these sort of money is speech chilling effect arguments as well. And just we just need to make sure we're also making the statutory arguments first because they're the, probably the most likely to succeed and have these as sort of a, a backup. They're all important, though. Uh, tough question, but do you see there being distinctions between Zcash and Monero with regards to how regulators may may deal with them? Those two protocols. I would say there shouldn't be, but I do think um, whether it's fair or not, Monero has gotten a reputation for for being more antagonistic <laughs> surveillance regulations. And I, I, you know, I'm with that. Like I'm hip to that. <laughs> God, I sound so old. <laughs> um, <laughs> I just said I'm hip. Um, uh, because uh, like, like that's what, that's a big part of coin center's mission is to, is to question the validity of surveillance, mass surveillance tools that are used without warrants. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think because the Monero community has been more standoffish and the Zcash community has been more like, ah, like both actually have view keys, right? Um, but Zcash early on was like all about the view keys. It's like, look, you'll be able to comply with uh, an order from a, from a government or something if you're an individual or, or an exchange. So there's, there's branding that might be difference. But again, as I, as I said in the beginning of my answer, there shouldn't be a difference. I don't think there's any legal difference. And I think also as people in government become more educated about these things, they'll probably treat these things more monolithically. One thing that we argue at Coin Center is this term privacy coin is a bad term, uh, at least from a government standpoint, because all of these protocols, if they're going to have long-term longevity, are going to adopt privacy enhanced features. Um, and so you should like, if you think you're coming for just the bad ones, the privacy coins, this is me talking to government. You've 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 made a mistake in categories. Like, you either have to come for it all, or 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 not at all, basically. Yeah, and it, just going further down. So, in addition to view key, you know, Monero has view keys, Zcash has, but there, there's also you know there's a lot of other differences. Um, you know, I I was looking at the Zcash you know website, and one of them is Zcash. You know, it's there's a whole compliance section. Zcash is fully uh, compatible with global AML CFT standards, including uh, uh, FAFTA recommendations. Uh, and it goes on to say, um, Zcash was designed to facilitate compliance with the FATF travel rule with an encrypted memo field that allows required originatory and beneficiary information to be attached to the virtual asset transfers between VASPs. Do you yeah. think there's a differentiator there? You know, is that I mean, field? Um... I, I think this is still mostly branding, honestly. So full okay. disclosure, I'm a board member of the Zcash Foundation. I've never been associated with the electronic coin company, which originally created the protocol. Um, but so I do have like roles in the Zcash space. Mostly I wanted to join the Zcash Foundation because Andrew Miller, who started it, asked me. Uh, it's a non-compensated position. So I was comfortable doing it, even though I was working at Coin Center. And I have like a, I can give people a heads up about legal stuff. So th I see my role on the Zcash Foundation board as just being like, look, this is coming from DC. You should know. Um, and other than that, we, we let the the other directors on the board and our executive director um, manage the foundation, which is there to create software. Um, so g given given my, my biases there, I would still nonetheless say, I think that's mostly branding. Like, doesn't Monero have an encrypted message field? Uh, yeah, different though. Like an op, like an op return type. Like yeah, I mean, it got, rid message, of, like... it got rid of its payment ID and yeah, it, it's, it's not, not really, not really anymore. And even if that's the case, though, and that's that's probably good from a from a minimizing the attack surface and making it making it more more sure to be you know private and and secure. Even if that's the case, it doesn't. 
the the rules for say the travel rule don't say that the message has to travel on chain with the transaction. It just says that the message has to travel between the two financial institutions. So it could be on some other network created between Monero uh, um, transacting financial institutions. I think the Zcash point is a is a legitimate point that baking it into the protocol and having it encrypted by default might make it easier for financial institutions to meet their obligations and maybe hopefully do it without compromising customer privacy because it is an encrypted memo field and there's no master key, there's no like backdoor that allows uh, investigators to, to see those messages without first going to the institutions that actually created the transactions or the individuals that actually created the transactions and getting, getting the view key for that message field. Um, but this is all really nuanced in the weeds. I know Again, this, is what, like, this is what we love to talk about on Monero Talk. I, I yeah, yeah, I hate to push you on these things. It's just no, no, I I love talking about it. Yeah. I'm saying it's in the. I love. I'm happy to talk about the weeds all day. <laughs> I don't think the weeds matter from a public policy standpoint, and I don't yeah. think it makes Zcash or Monero any more or less likely to be the target of say sanctions which would be a, a misapplication of sanctions in both cases or necessarily like FATF travel rule requirements. How about like the, the opt-in privacy, right? So Monero being private by default, Zcash being opt-in, is there concern that, you know, are those arguments that can be made against Zcash, right? Because now it's it's a tool that people you use for obfuscating transactions uh, as opposed to being default where it's just used for all all types of transactions even when you're not looking to necessarily obfuscate. I think that you've got you're onto something there as far as like this scale between Ethereum and Monero. Ethereum, it's all public by default and you have to use a specific address to get privacy, something like Tornado Cash. Zcash, it's public by default. Well, but a lot of wallets actually make shielded the default and there's just two halves of this protocol. And then Monero, it's just private private by default. A, I'll just say my personal preference is that Zcash deprecates um, transparent addresses. I think they're they're old tech. They're mostly a holdover from Zcash forking Bitcoin directly and not wanting to move too fast and break things as far as shielded pools, which is fair. Um, you can still have opt out um, publicity um, by sharing a view key with the world or with a regulator. So that's that's my my personal viewpoint about how the Zcash protocol should evolve, I think, which should evolve towards something like privacy by default, like, like Monero in that case. Um, now, what does this mean from a regulatory standpoint? I do think when you, when you as a regulator can point to an address and say this much North Korean money is going into it, it makes it easier for you to make your case that this is within your power to add to the sanctions list. And so the question for Zcash would be, if we had transparent addresses that we knew we could identify as, say, North Korean, and they start using a shielded pool, does that still give the regulator something they can point to that isn't the whole protocol, but is this thing that is... So they can say, look, we're not outlawing the protocol. We're just outlawing certain types of usage of the protocol, which is primarily illicit. Mm -hmm. And that would still be wrong, just as it's wrong in Tornado Cash, because most people using Tornado Cash are not criminals. Most people using Zcash shields and pools are not criminals and people deserve privacy, but it gives them this thing to point to. The thing is, this is also kind of a weird metaphysical argument because the protocol as a, as a whole could just be viewed as one alternative among many cryptocurrencies. And so you could say, we're not, we're not making all cryptocurrencies illegal. We're just saying you can't use these ones that have privacy. And that could apply to something like Monero that is even private by default. But you're forcing the regulator to be a bit more honest about what they're doing in the process. We're banning a whole cryptocurrency. We're not just banning these bad addresses. We're banning a whole cryptocurrency. And so the Monero example forces the regulator to take the most aggressive posture <clears throat> as far as their statutory authority, and then maybe makes it easier to challenge that aggressive posture because it's overreach. And so I would, uh, Zcash and Bitcoin and Ethereum people might hate me for saying this, but I'll say something um, that I should on a podcast like this. I would be happier defending Monero on statutory grounds, maybe than certain other cryptocurrencies, because it forces the conversation. It says, "Look, this is a whole protocol. Everyone's got privacy on this protocol. You saying everyone who uses this is a criminal? That's ridiculous." Uh, 
Venera people are gonna like that. They're gonna like the sound of that. Um, I'll, I'll put the. I know. I, I, I know. I get flack in the Monero community because I I did take the board position at the Zcash Foundation, and I always hope that like. I think we're just jealous. I think we just want you on on Team Monero, but obviously you hey, are. If, 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 if the Monero Andrew Miller had come to me and asked, I, I would have. I, I probably would have joined. I don't, uh, <laughs> I don't know who that is. is that, I don't know who's that Monero Andrew Miller. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I'll, I'll put the the, the corporate entity aspect so obviously you know zcash is is you know open source protocol but it it also it's kind of you know it, it it has this corporation associated with it it has this foundation so are those also potential targets so this this is one where i don't think anyone's got strong arguments um the the, the line of argumentation that this tees up is you can't cite this technology on your SDN list because there isn't an entity or group of persons behind it, right? And so the Tornado Cash like uh, listing raises these questions. Like if the entity that they're sanctioning is not North Korean funds in the address, but the persons or group that created the address and the smart contracts at that address, can they argue we're not an entity because we never created a, I don't know, a Delaware incorporated corporation? or a US-based 501c3 or a whatever, a Cayman Island Foundation? No, because there's still a group of people. They're just treated as an unincorporated organization. And from some legal standpoints, that's worse because they will find you <laughs> unless you're like really careful and willing to live in, a, in the jungle in Belize or something. They will find you. They will seek extradition. Maybe the country extraditing will decide not to extradite. Like, this gets into like Kim.com stuff and Julian Assange stuff. But like, do you really want to be living in a hotel in London for five years and then ultimately get caught anyway? Like they're really aggressive. They, they will recognize that there are people who could have formed a Delaware LLC and didn't, but they're still a group. They're still an entity. Mm -hmm. They will find them and they will hold them jointly and severally liable for the actions of what they, what they perceive as the group. And because you never incorporated, you actually don't have limited liability status under any jurisdiction's laws, which means even one person could be held fully liable for the actions of the whole group, rather than uh, having a, a personal liability shield through a, through a corporate status. Granted, a lot of these rules like OFAC pierce the corporate veil, so it's not that much better to be an incorporated entity in the US, because if you were to willfully violate OFAC, it wouldn't matter if you did it behind a corporate entity. Um, which is why no one should violate OFAC, which is also why we should be careful what we sanction we put in the SDN list because we could. this is a really aggressive tool. Um, so in general, this argument that like it's sufficiently decentralized, there's so many developers and they're uncoordinated that there's not an entity to go after is just not going to work in the long run because at the end of the day, there are core developers and like they can be found and they can be treated as people working together on a project almost as easily as you could say point to the Zcash Foundation or the Electronic Coin Company or some discernible incorporated entity and say, those are the guys, go get them. And then the defenses for both will be the same. They'll be, we just write speech. We just write code. You can't hold us liable. I'm just saying that the we're not an entity argument is pretty much a non-starter. You don't you don't gain much from that as far as your legal defenses. You might gain time because it's harder to get a hold of the people. But that's more of a cypherpunk legal strategy, which is ignore the law rather than a legal strategy, which is <laughs> genuflect to the law because the law is important. We live in a society, um, but fight using the law for your First Amendment rights. Or right, something. right, right. I think that's a little bit of the strife between the Monero community and the Zcash community too, right? I think the Zcash community is taking a little bit more of the the know the law approach and, you know, uh, Monero is much more... Oh, maybe. May, Maybe you'll disagree, but, you know, much more, you know, uh, just building cypherpunk tech, uh, no, not, I, not asking I, for permission. I, not only do I not disagree, uh, I think it's really good that both approaches exist. And I've, I've said this before, like, um, to the extent I'm more enmeshed in the Zcash community because of just the path dependency of my life and who who, who talked to me at the right time, I would be very sad if one or the other didn't exist. And I'd love to see more. Like I'm sad Mimble Wimble never took off, uh, really. Uh, and I'm excited for a lot of the new stuff out there um, that's getting a lot of funding. Um, 
which can be a different kind of Achilles heel if you take a bunch of venture capital money to build your new thing. But I'm excited that there is a lot of venture capital funding now for, for new new projects to do zero knowledge privacy for things like smart contracts and things like that. So I, I, yeah. know, I know you got to go soon. I just want to get one more like topic in mining. Um, Mm. You, are, are we concerned that we might see more uh, crackdown in terms of regulation on mining, OFAC compliant mining? And is you know something like Bitcoin uh, can can easily um, implement these things, whereas something like Monero it, it would practically be impossible to even to even implement. Just curious what your your take is on mining in general. Yeah, that's right. a whole whole big conversation maybe subject for a future because i don't want to like i want to i want to be careful here you basically have opposing sides or opposing arguments on on the one side with a transparent base layer you can say we're actively taking steps to comply and we're blocking these addresses but at a certain point does that actually defeat your ability to achieve consensus and so like if most of the hash power was in the us um, and all U.S. miners were excluding OFAC mark, marked addresses to comply with OFAC. Like, have we destroyed censorship resistance because somebody who's a, a sanctioned person, maybe wrongly sanctioned, a freedom fighter, legitimately, can't get a transaction on the Bitcoin network anymore? That's a problem. Um, they, or, or they have to wait three days before some miner who's not based in a in a in a sanction sanctioning jurisdiction decides to put the transaction in the block. The counter argument to what I'm saying here is, well, yeah, but there's always going to be miners all over the world, and so Chinese miners will be happy to put transactions in a block that Americans don't like, and American miners will be happy to put transactions in a block that Chinese authorities don't like, and so it it, it seeks a balance amongst geopolitics. I'm not sure, maybe, and then the counter argument. Or the alternative to all of this is miners shouldn't have any knowledge of what's in a block. And to me, that gives them plausible deniability, which is important because it says, like, look, we're freaking communications intermediaries. We move packets around the world. Yes, our packets are about money, but money is speech and money is important. And we don't want to have sensors interposing themselves between all of humanity's financial interactions. We just want the ability to go after people once we know they did something wrong, not before they're able to transact. And so to me, censorship resistance is better guaranteed by privacy in the sense of miners not having the ability to look into and discriminate between the transactions they're validating. And so to me, I, I think I, I have, this is a huge technological discussion. Both sides make good points, so I don't want to sound um, like I know the answer. But something in my brain is telling me that in the long run, if you want censorship resistance, you need base layer privacy. But I might be wrong about that. All right. I, I, I certainly tend to agree with that. Peter, thank you so much, man. Greatly appreciate your your person overall, the fact that you exist in crypto. Like I said in, in the opening, uh, you know, you're doing an amazing job. So, so greatly appreciate that and certainly appreciate you taking the time today to, to come on Monero Talk, man. Thanks. It's been a lot of fun and I'm happy to come back as, as things develop, which I'm sure they will. I don't know if you said we're doing an event uh, in New York City on Halloween uh, near your old oh, cool. grounds in uh, Washington Square Park. We're calling it a, a privacy protest. Uh, we're going to try to get people to anonymously assemble. And hey, free speech. Free speech. Tech, we'll have tech a few, assembly, yeah. few speakers out there talking about these topics. Uh you know, maybe we could talk after. We'd love for you to participate in some way if possible. Um, yeah. yeah. Just want to get that out, th out there too. That's awesome. Yeah, I'd love to see the details. Sounds good. Cool. All right, brother. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to our show on YouTube, Odyssey, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Go to MoneroTalk.live to subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.